I get to introduce Arjuman Siddiqui, one of my best friends, both professionally and personally. And uh, we're going to talk about an important topic today. We're a little late getting started now because we just left my racial economic disparity course where we were refuting the, salt, the slavery salt hypertension hypothesis, the argument that explains differences in black-white hypertension as being attributed to a selective process from slavery where black Americans have a genetic abnormality from the cruel conditions that they withstood where they are more likely to retain salt. So that might sound like a theory that um, is useful or a, a good theory to explain the large disparities, but if you look at empirical evidence, as well as what we know about how the selection process takes place with genes, it's hogwash. Um, I also want to mention that Today is a day where we have disrupt the classroom in, in the new school, and you, some of you got this button of, that says 400. So we are having a rollout of events which will um, be very large next year where we talk about 400 years of inequality and oppression since uh, blacks first arrived in, in, the, new, in, in the Americas. Um, but Without further ado, let me give the introduction to bio to my good friend Arjuman. I had prepared myself some notes, but I can't find them in my mess. But uh, Arjuman is a Canadian research chair in population health equity and an associate professor at the Dalla Lana School of Public Health, University of Toronto, where she holds appointments in the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children, and is also an adjunct associate professor at the Gilling School of Global Public Health, University of North Carolina. Um, Dr. Siddiqui is interested in understanding how societal conditions produce and resolve inequalities in population health and human development across the lifespan, so basically from cradle to grave. Her research focuses primarily on the roles of resource inequities and social policies, the methods and metrics that enable scientific inquiry on health inequality, and the mechanisms related to public and political uptake of evidence. So she not only studies theory, empirical evidence, but she's very interested in how we can solve these problems as well. She's an alumnus of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Global Academy and former associate member of its program on successful societies. She's also a member of the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants of, of Health Knowledge, a hub on early childhood development, and has consulted with several other, other international agencies, including the World Bank and UNICEF. Basically, she's busy and does a lot. Um, she, she has her degree in social epide epidemiology from Harvard and the School, of Public, at the School of Public Health at Harvard. And again, um, the endearing thing of having my colleague and friend here is uh, um, we, I think you'll see tonight, are going to tag team very well where Arjuman is going to lead off with a discussion of what it means to have health inequities as well as some of the approaches by different societies that, that might be used to address health in, in, inequalities. Um, and then I'm going to try to bring in some of my economic perspective to look at some of the differences across race and uh, how that translates into health. So right now, I will be quiet and let the person you came to see come up to the stage and lead us off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Derek. It is um, a huge, huge treat to be here. Uh, my watch just told me to breathe, so uh, maybe I'll do that first. Whenever I hear bios like that, it's always like this cognitive dissonance, uh, like who is that person? And I have a very good friend in the audience who knows me better and knows that usually I'm just watching TV. So uh, do with that what you will. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about race and health and um, uh, give you sort of a snapshot way of thinking about the knowledge that we have and um, 
what might be the fundamental causes of racial health inequalities. And then as Derek said, he'll sort of give um, a perspective and, and hopefully we can cobble together some interesting thoughts to uh, get us started. All right, this isn't clicking, so I will just use this. Um, so I wanted to just start actually with um, uh, uh, mentioning a study that a, a friend and colleague, Dan Zuberi, did some time ago. It was actually his dissertation work, and he published a book called Differences uh, Matter. And it was a qualitative study where he looked at Southeast Asian immigrants who were low-income hotel workers, and he basically compared their lives in the, those who were in Seattle and those were in, who were in Vancouver. And he made this case that this is the same group. They immigrated from the same place. Uh, they work in the same industry. They're at the same income level uh, for random reasons. And he thinks they were pretty random. Some ended up immigrating to Seattle, others to Vancouver. And so he compares their uh, lives and he says, so life for the working poor, this particular group in Seattle, is strikingly harder and more stressful than for their neighbors in Vancouver. It's not because folks in Seattle are lazier or dumber than folks in Vancouver. It's because laws have created wildly different environments in two cities and in the two cities and in the two nations. And uh, I, I often start with this because it's a nice way to describe some of the motivation behind my comparative work, which is if you have different societies, different conditions, are they producing different health inequalities? Uh, and so much of what I've done is sort of an extension of this in terms of trying to understand whether uh, racial health inequalities would be different in societies that have uh, arguably wildly different environments and different laws. So what do we know about racial health inequalities? Uh, this will be sort of no news for many of you. Uh, if you look at the statistics in the US, they are really incredibly alarming. Uh, this is life expectancy for different groups. No, uh, this one. Um, life expectancy in, in whites and blacks by gender. And you can see that, thank you, and you can see that the uh, highest life expectancy accrues to white women. We know often that women have life or higher life expectancies than men. So partly what's striking about these uh, data is that black women really don't have much of an edge over white men, uh, which, which should concern us, which should shock us, given that uh, women should have some uh, uh, advantage for a variety of reasons that I won't go into today. And this life expectancy stat is made up of uh, higher rates of, of uh, sickness, of a variety of illnesses from cradle to grave, from birth rate right through cardiovascular disease and so on in, in adulthood that strike African Americans m at a much uh, higher rate than whites in the US. So uh, my team and I wanted to know what does the situation look like in Canada? which, as I said, does have significantly different laws and so on, but we're not comparing apples and oranges. You know, we are not comparing high and low income countries that are at different stages of development. These are both OECD nations. They share a border. Uh, you know, you can get a nexus pass to get uh, through security quick and so on and so forth. Uh, so there should be some sort of reasonable uh, uh, comparison to be made. Uh, so we couldn't get life expectancy data because, incidentally, Canada is really bad at, correct, at collecting race data. But here's what we found. So in the blue bars are the odds of a certain condition, heart disease, hypertension, obesity, smoking, uh, drinking, and self-rated health. In blue is the US results, and in red are the Canadian results. And if you fall above that number one, it means that blacks are at higher risk. If you fall below num the number one, blacks are at lower risk. So blacks are at lower risk for smoking, heavy drinking, and to some extent, heart disease. But what's interesting about this is that Canadian blacks tend to have um, much lower risk and more protection. So for example, in the case of hypertension, uh, Canadian uh, blacks compared to their white counterparts have a smaller di disparity than you see in the US. 
infinitely more true for obesity. In the case of heart disease, they're much more protected uh, than are blacks in the uh, US. Same thing for smoking, same thing for drinking. Uh, Self-rated health, you see a large black-white disparity in the US, not so large in Canada. And the question is then, why might this be? Why might we see different black-white disparities in two countries that are relatively similar? And again, my starting point is that uh, this may be, be uh, because societal conditions are different. So I'm going to start actually not with the societal conditions, though, but just working from the basics of what we know about health to build uh, a, a, a story, if you will, uh, with the evidence on why societal differences might help us explain this. And I have to say, actually, um, this talk kind of helped me refine some of my ideas uh, and, and sort of pose new questions for me. So some of what I'm going to say, I'm sort of trying out on you guys. Um, so what we know about health in general, leaving aside health disparities for a minute, is that health is produced by some combination of a gene-environment interaction. So the basis of everything that happens to us is, is some interaction between those factors. And I hope I don't need to uh, tell the crowd that race is not a genetic construct, but just in case there are, are, are folks who are um, uh, non-believers. Uh, let me show you some interesting data this is data from the state of Illinois, where they looked at birth weight distributions in three groups. Uh, white children born to white moms who were born in the US, black children born to black moms who the black moms are born in the US, and black children born to black moms who the, where the moms were born uh, elsewhere, meaning they were black immigrants to the US. So they looked at the birth weight distributions of these three groups in the uh, the uh, dashed line here is the uh, distribution of uh, African-American moms' babies' birth weights. Uh, and in the uh, sort of diamond-shaped uh, line is the distribution of white American birth weights. And almost entirely superimposing that, is the distribution for uh, black immigrant moms' birth weights. So the two distributions that are more similar are those of white American moms and black immigrant moms. Uh, a really striking refutation of a genetic hypothesis for birth weight. So if it's not genes, uh, what is it? Well, because racial groups are not genetic groups, which is why you see data like that cropping up, Disparities in health can only be produced by disparities in exposures. They cannot be produced by disparities in genes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about exposures and how exposures then become biologically embedded, become health outcomes. If it's not that it's our genes, uh, how is this happening? Because at some level, it has to influence our biology. This is a kind of schematic by Bruce McEwen and his colleagues uh, that gives a sort of simple sense of many of the ways that exposure differences can become biological differences. Uh, and, and they start with this idea that we perceive stress. Something happens in our environment and we perceive stress. And uh, they give three sort of general stresses that we perceive. Uh, traumas and abuses that cause us stress, major life events, a death in the family, a divorce, et cetera, uh, and what they call sort of general environmental stressors at work, at home, in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood. And you can imagine that these stressors are more sort of low grade, but chronic. And they actually think that these ones are the largest culprits particularly for racial disparities in health or uh, in general for, for uh, health disparities. So the idea is that you perceive a stress and often you perceive it on a chronic basis. And when you perceive that stress, your body reacts in a couple of ways. One way it reacts is by um, making you figure out how to cope with that stress, which results in behavior changes of one sort or another. Uh, uh, substance use, including eating, 
sedentary behavior, lack of activity, and so on, sleep disturbances, et cetera. Uh, and so your body sort of reacts to stress in, in many behavioral patterns. But it also reacts to stress through an actual direct physiological response. So our bodies are actually made to deal with stress at some level. We have uh, uh, physiological systems that help our bodies cope with stress. The problem is that they're mostly designed to cope with occasional stress. And part of what the biological theory is, uh, is that we're actually experiencing these chronic stressors, and these chronic stress stressors are throwing off our physiological systems in ways that result in hypertension and obesity and diabetes, et cetera. So we have some evidence, actually, that these stress processes are quite different by race. Um, this is a measure of stress load, allostatic load, we often call it. Um, and the higher this line, the greater the amount of stress. And uh, this top line here is the allostatic load for blacks, the bottom line for whites. And you can see that blacks have higher stress loads and that that disparity increases uh, as people age, and we think that's the case because as you age, you've experienced more chronic stress. So it's not that something happens at age 55 that doesn't happen at 25. Maybe that's part of it. You have a mortgage here and maybe not there. Uh, but the big deal really is that you've by 50 or so, you've, you've experienced quite a bit uh, over time, and so there's more accumulation of this physiological load. Again, what we think is happening is that there's more physiological load, there's more biological impact in general because blacks are experiencing more particularly chronic stressors. Um, and so in this next part, I'll take you through a little bit of an argument about what then might be causing differences in chronic stressors, if that's the biological basis of health disparities, what's the social basis of that? What, what can explain why in Canada we see different levels of chronic stress than we do in the U.S.? Um, in the U.S., not surprising to anybody, there are many sources of chronic stress. Uh, certainly, uh, police interactions is, is a big one uh, to consider. Uh, and so one might hypothesize then that the reason you see less health disparity between blacks and whites in Canada is because there's less racism. There's less sources of chronic uh, stress from institutions in Canada compared to uh, the U.S. And certainly that is how Canada would like to think of itself. Uh, this is, is very much a mantra uh, in Canada. We have a National Multiculturalism Day, in fact. Um, and uh, the antithesis of the melting pot is really what uh, we consider ourselves to be. You see this you know, quite frequently everywhere. This is a union poster uh, and so on. So uh, given the, the uh, police uh, issues that have cropped up in the U.S., one possibility is maybe we don't have the same degree of police issues uh, in Canada. I don't think that that's the case. It, I, I could be convinced that the degree is different, but this is not a scenario where you can say that there is a source of institutional racism in the U.S. that is not present in Canada. In other words, I think we can do away with the hypothesis that at least in terms of stress from a police state, that Canada is somehow free of this and that that's why their disparities are smaller. Uh, many people may have seen uh, this disturbing video of uh, uh, police uh, personnel treating a uh, black girl in this case in a school. I don't remember where it was. Does, I don't know if anyone does. Uh, but in the U.S., uh, is it the case that, you know, educational systems are less racist in Canada? Again, I'm not thoroughly convinced. There are police present in poor, particularly black schools in, in Toronto, at least. And so it's unclear whether the answer to lower stress is that 
there is this uh, sort of difference in uh, institutional racism in many of facets of, of uh, in many places where you see routine racism in the U.S. Uh, is it true that the labor market looks really different? Uh, this is a study uh, that was done in the U.S. where they showed that uh, people with very common black names are uh, uh, less likely to get called back for interviews for jobs than people with very common white names all other things being equal. So they did experiments where they sent out resumes that looked identical except for your name, and they still found these uh, differences. Um, and uh, my, is this on here? No, I'll, I'll just tell this quick story because I love it. Uh, my advisor in grad school who is of Japanese origin and has a wife who is white from Canada, they have a daughter named Emily. And Emily uh, was the lowest getting, uh, callback getting white girl name. And that name had slightly lower callbacks than the top black name, which was Ebony. So he used to say that he was actively encouraging her to change her name to Ebony. Um, so is it the case that we have less labor market discrimination of this nature, again, which would produce chronic stress in Canada, it doesn't look like it. It looks like there still is uh, a decent number of, sort of incidents in Canada that are starting to point, absent great data, starting to point to systematic racial discrimination in Canada as well. They have done a similar resume study, by the way, in Canada, but they did it using uh, names that are uh, uh, from uh, particular regions of the world, again, because we don't measure race very well, so they used names as proxies to figure out if you have uh, a different sounding name uh, than a white name, uh, were you less likely to get callbacks? Yes, you were. So we actually did a study where we looked at uh, everyday discrimination in Canada to try to figure out systematically what's, what the situation is. Uh, and we did, in fact, find that compared to whites, blacks in particular, and to a slightly lesser degree, aboriginals in Canada, uh, we call our uh, First Nations people either First Nations, aboriginal, uh, the equivalent of Native Americans in the US, uh, were much more likely to experience discrimination. This is adjusted for age, sex, and everything else you can imagine. Um, so aboriginals, for example, were uh, just over one and a half times more likely to report being treated with less courtesy and respect than others. Uh, blacks almost twice as likely to receive poor service. Uh, blacks almost three times as likely uh, to be treated as not smart. Blacks almost one, as a, one and a half times as likely. Uh, and check out feared by others. Right? So, so we're, we're sort of grateful that we have our own version of uh, social movements that are trying to address this stuff as well. So given this context, would I tell you that less racism is changing the stress context for Canadians and therefore we have better health outcomes? I don't think so. And I'm totally open to being challenged on this in terms of sort of quantity, quality, et cetera, which I don't, I think is an open question, but I would not attribute at this point uh, differences in racial disparities to differences in racism per se. Um, so we're still with this dilemma though. So why do we see differences in health disparities? Well, my, my working hypothesis is that somehow the racism in Canada is being buffered a bit better than it is in the US. And I come back to my friend Dan's uh, idea that this is about wildly different laws uh, and different environments. And so the question is, if it's not institutional racism differences, what is uh, buffering um, health in, in Canada compared to the US? And um, my, my sense is that this is about laws that are different in Canada, policies that are different in Canada, that provide decent conditions for everybody irrespective of race, and that this is having some buffering effect uh, um, against sort of all of the other circumstances. Uh, so I'll go through this rather quickly. Um, you can look at what our countries spend money on. The amount of social spending on basic safety net issues is much higher uh, in Canada than the US. Um, 
the amount that is dedicated to military as opposed to public goods and so on, um, much greater in Canada than the US. So there's a bit of a public social spending, a welfare state story to be had. If you look at the income inequality between the two countries, uh, what's really striking is that um, before you account for taxes and transfers, meaning before policies kick in to redistribute income, income inequality is similar in both countries. These are Gini coefficients, so the higher the number, the more the inequality. Um, and you can see they've risen in both countries much more uh, uh, at a much more staggering pace uh, in the US and Canada. But take a look at what happens after you um, redistribute, meaning after taxes kick in and all kinds of transfers kick in. What happens in Canada is that those taxes and transfers actually work to reduce income inequality to a much larger extent than you find in the US. This is not a race-specific issue, but my sense is that one reason we might be seeing uh, less disparity in Canada is because there are some blanket class-based sort of sensibilities and policies that may be acting as buffers. Same thing with unions. Much higher rates of unionization in Canada uh, at 26.5% in 2015, only 10.6% of Americans unionized um, in, in that year. So the working hypothesis then is that things like economic inequality in general, social spending, labor market security, and so on, are buffering the effect of what seems to be systematic racism uh, in Canada and therefore causing less stress and uh, therefore trigger triggering uh, different sets, uh, you know, healthier behaviors, less physiological stress, and so on. And so if I were to rewrite my friend Dan's uh, narrative in this context, I might say, uh, so health for blacks in the United States is strikingly harder and more stressful than for their neighbors in Canada. And it's not because folks in the US have different genes, and we're not even sure if it's that they have different quantity or quality of racism. What we are quite certain of, though, is that laws regarding economic equality and spending on economically disadvantaged populations has created wildly different environments for blacks and whites in the two nations. And I will leave it at that. So before I start, I wanted to show you a video And the video fits very well because the people featured in the video, the two prominent people featured in the video, they'll be at the new school tomorrow. If I can find it. Here we go. I, no? Okay, here it is. So tomorrow there's going to be a lecture entitled Death and Despair, Increasing Mortality Among White, Middle-Aged, Less Educated Americans. It's sponsored by the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. And uh, Ann Case, and, I'm sorry, yeah, Ann Case and uh, Angus Deaton are going to be presenting. And this video is really putting a framing into their, what they're talking about, which is Death and Despair, Increasing Mortality Among white, middle-aged, less educated Americans. So the phenomenon was that over a period of time, more a more recent period of time, this demographic of white, middle-aged Americans without a high school, with less education, less than a college degree, they had an increase in mortality where nobody else, no one else's mortality increased. Last week, economics correspondent Paul Salmon examined the role prescription painkillers and alcohol may play in the trend. Tonight, he explores how the economy and the job market may be involved. It's part of our weekly series, Making Sense, which airs Thursdays. The Hardee's in Maysville, Kentucky, a popular hangout for the senior set. 
Martin Sauer used to work for the sheriff's department, where he says he saw his share of Saturday night drunks, but nothing like the current opioid drug epidemic. People get hooked on it and can't get off of it or don't want to, and causing a lot of the younger generation to lose their lives. And by younger generation, Sauer means his middle-aged neighbors, who, as we reported last week, are experiencing a stunning rise in premature deaths due to alcoholism, suicide, and drug abuse. But why? The health crisis here is particularly among white working class or white people with a high school and no more. For those people, e the economy has been very hard for a very long time. Predictably, Angus Deaton and Ann Case, economists who have documented the dramatic decrease in life expectancy, say an obvious place to look for a cause is the economy. It used to be with a high school degree, you could get a job that actually could provide for your family. Yeah. And the disappearance of those may lead people to feel a lot more stressed. Indeed, in the period covered by their study, 1999 to 2014, inflation-adjusted income for households headed by a high school graduate fell by 19 percent. Well away from the ivory tower, on the ground in Maysville, Wayne Pendleton has lived the change. Maysville, when we moved here, was a pretty well flourishing little town right here. But we've lived here, what, 17 years? And you can just name the stuff that's left here. You can't take a job away from a guy 55 years old and expect him to start all over again. Even at my age, it's depressing if you're not trying to do something. Despite four heart attacks, Sherman Saunders still wants to work. That's not somebody else's responsibility to take care of the family. It's supposed to be yours. Get out and go to work and do that yourself. Most of the men aren't working. Marcy Connor, a nurse specializing in substance abuse, has a close-up view of the downward spiral. All of a sudden, you lose your job. So here is a male with no identity. He's not working. He's supposed to be a provider for his family. He can't even do that. So that low self-worth along with that hopelessness feeling, we start seeing tremendous depression. So how do you relieve depression? You can relieve it with drug use, alcohol use, or suicide. Connor's own husband died of alcohol poisoning. Poured alcohol down the, his feeding tube until he died. The husband of best friend Becky Manning also killed himself. He blew his head off. Joseph Manning had been a truck driver for 30 years. And then he retired at 55, which then gave him nothing to do. Then he started getting depressed, and then we would go to different doctors, and then they would just try different drugs, uh -huh. and those never worked because they caused, they caused side effects, which made him feel worse about himself. Uh -huh. Weight gain. Yes, he gained weight. Libido. Absolutely, uh -huh. you know, or I'm worthless. You know, uh -huh. I can't be here for my wife, you know. So when you hear about the end of work, the jobs like truck driver jobs, which right. will be replaced by absolutely self-driving cars, you think, what are these men going to do? Yeah. In this next generation, I think you're going to see the death rate continue mm -hmm. to climb. Nice deep breath. Local doctor Craig Denham buys Good. into the economic hypothesis. Economics is a major component. Job availability is a major component. So, case closed. Economics explains the epidemic of suicide and overdose deaths ravaging America's white working class. Not so fast, say Case and Deaton. Because Europeans have suffered too in this, uh, you know, the jobs leaving the country, but we don't see them killing themselves. Yeah, you know, Spain suffered, the unemployment rate went from 5% to like 25%, and health improved. And what about working class black Americans? African Americans' rates of deaths from suicide, drug overdose, and alcohol have been flat. They have not risen. It's not as if stress is something new to the black American population. We've been dealing with stress for quite a long time. Economist Derek Hamilton. The, the impact of stress is, is not new, so that's why you're probably not seeing an uptick in the way it is for whites. We're used to struggle, <laughs> unfortunately. And also there's this argument on the other side that, you know, whites have been ahead for so long that they, when they see their world coming apart, even though they're still doing much better than blacks, and they see equalization as oppression.
the group that they studied is one that has by almost every concrete measure been falling behind in recent decades. Economist Bob Frank has devoted much of his career to the study of inequality. Life is graded on the curve. Uh, it, it's not how well you do in absolute terms, it's how well you do relative to your competitors. Or relative to your own past. And if you're in a chronic loser position, I think that's a position that just wears people down eventually. Psychologically and physiologically, as low status is linked to decreased serotonin in the brain, which can cause dysphoria, a state of intense unease and distress. I'm going to stop it here in the interest of time, um, but suffice it to say that one of the puzzles is that American whites did not uniquely experience hard times. Um, other groups did as well, but as uh, Deaton and Case and Franks in the video, they kind of allude to some sort of relative positioning argument, and that is a lot of what stratification economics is about. It's not just absolute positioning, but relative positioning, how we fit in in a hierarchy. Um, I should also mention that Arjuman told me earlier that one of the benefits that she gets as a university professor is up to $1,000 to purchase massages over the year. So new school, fa new school administrators out there, my stress is high. I want to... <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, Arjuman did an excellent job of linking these disparities to policies. Um, I think I'm going to try to expand and also link it to rhetoric itself, the American rhetoric around work hard to overcome your obstacles. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the high achieving black Americans as measured by education still exhibit large economic and health disparities relative to their white peers. So let's look at those that are doing well especially in the domain of wealth, I will discuss how that the rhetoric around post-racial America and the politics of personal responsibility, as well as a neoliberal paternalism, a term coined by Joe Soss, Richard Fording, Freuding, and Sanford Tram, um, how those tropes lead to a, a removal of public responsibilities for the conditions of black Americans, as well as the poor, and instead encourage punitive policies to manage their seemingly bad behavior. Um, I will present this in the frame. Let me actually just get into it. Also, something else I'm going to try to do is allow reference slides to air in the background while I talk. So that might be distracting, but you can see some of the evidence to what it is I'm saying. And it should work automatically. All right, so in terms of economic security, wealth provides the beginning and the end. It is the primary indicator of security. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite education, both in grade school and college, access capital to start a business, finance expensive medical procedures, reside in neighborhoods with higher amenities, exert political influence through campaign financing, Purchase better counsel if confronted with an expensive legal system, leave a bequest, and or withhold, with, withstand financial hardship resulting from any number of emergencies. Wealth provides financial agency over one's life. Simply put, wealth gives individuals choice. It provides the economic security to take risk, and it shields against financial loss. Data from the Federal Reserve the survey of consumer finance indicates that the top 10% of American households hold about three quarters of the nation's wealth. Moreover, the bottom half of all households hold about 1% of the nation's wealth. I always think that's a novel way of thinking of the 1%. What is frequently overlooked in these disparities is that race is more pronounced than class itself in defining one's wealth position. For instance, black and Latinos collectively make up about 30% of the U.S. population, but they collectively own about 7% of the nation's wealth. Progressives often make economic productivity arguments to justify a greater emphasis on economic equity. 
So they argue that if everybody, if we lift all boats, the country would do better. Such arguments may be valid, but they're context specific. For example, we can think of slavery in which we, we had periods of growth through exploitation as well as other periods in American history. I prefer the Reverend Dr. William Barber's equity framing that economic justice is a moral imperative. With such an approach, economic inclusion becomes the explicit goal regardless of the context that we're in. Basically, we need a societal shift from overemphasizing economic austerity and growth, which leaves workers vulnerable to the fickle contingencies of trickle-down job creation. Instead, to promote economic mobility, we need to prioritize economic equity, fairness, and what the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen characterizes as a human capabilities approach where we measure our national economic health by how well we enable all our citizens to attain their self-defined goals. The emergent dogma of how our society is based on the emergent dogma of how our society is based on a faith that markets are somehow natural, transparent, or efficient, as, as well as inevitable, is problematic. Markets, whether they're product markets, labor markets, financial markets, are presumed to be self-regulating. The most astute, the most valued, the hardest workers are believed to prosper and endure, while the least astute, the laziest, and the least valued are presumed to receive their just rewards or simply fade away or have to find something else to do over time. These presumptions pay little attention to the roles of power and initial capital and how that power and capital can adjust to alter the rules and structures of transactions and markets to privilege power and capital in the first place. It is silly to presume or assume that those with power and capital are simply price takers. In addition, my economics profession has fallen short in its understanding of how the role of group identities such as race and gender in their intersections relate to material and psychological well-being. For the most part, my profession views group identity and prejudice as an exogenously determined binary that represents preferences, tastes, bigotry, bigotry, or ignorance. It ignores the agency and benefits that individuals have in choosing and investing in their collective group identity and how social structures may increase or decrease the value and incentives, incentives to invest in that identity. Without such an analysis, the economic profession is more than complicit in the continued trajectory towards stratification, both within and across nation state. Nonetheless, our long trend towards inequality is not without tension. So let's talk a little bit about the past election. The last election seems at least a rebellion, albeit a full overthrow of the current system. The presidential election victory of Donald Trump caught most pundits and political scientists off guard. The fact that the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton got about 95% of the black woman vote, a stronghold of the Democratic Party, while about two-thirds of the white male population, a long-term stronghold of the Republican Party, went for Donald Trump. Well, that's not surprising. However, um, given Trump's, especially given his overtly nostalgic Make America Great Again, which is obviously trying to symbolize a period in which white male relative economic privilege was at its peak. What was surprising was about 30% of the Latino vote that was revealed by exit polls that went to Trump despite his rhetoric exemplified by his campaign kickoff in which he likened Mexicans to rapists, murderers, and drug traffickers. Also surprising was the majority support that Trump received from white women, despite repeated examples of his gender-based hostility, including the not-so-subtle reference to rage and menstruation directed at Megyn Kelly and the unauthorized release of the Access Hollywood tape, in which he asserts that he can take certain liberties with women. However, if this election is viewed from the perspective of stratification economics or critical race theory, the results become less surprising. President Trump's campaign slogan of making America great again and his signal that I am your last chance with overtures to the pending demographic shift and with whites will no longer be a numerical majority was all about codifying the property rights and whiteness. 
But how did Trump doubling down on an appeal to white American identity still enable him to secure 30% of the Latino vote? Latinos are not a heterogeneous group. They have varied national origins, patterns of Im immigration, yet still two-thirds of the Latino American population descends from Mexico, a group that was clearly vilified by Trump. Stratification economics notes that there may be intermediate and economic as well as psychological benefits associated with distancing from an out-group identity towards an in-group identity. In this case, that would be a white American identity. The theory recognized that identities are multifaceted, not so dichotomous. As such, there are incentives for members of the out-group to try to identify to the extent they can with an in-group identity. Political pundits have also attributed Trump's stunning victory to an economic populism. However, exit polls are not consistent with the economic populist mandate. A majority of households earning less than $50,000 voted for Hillary Clinton, while no candidate attained a clear majority of votes in any other income groups. Two things are unambiguous from, this, from, from racial stratification. So, you know, one might ask, why don't we have coalition between blacks and whites white working class and black workers. Well, there are two things that are unambiguous. One is that black workers are made worse off from racial stratification. And two, the capitalist class, which is overwhelmingly white, is made better off. What is ambiguous is the economic positioning of white workers in terms of their class positioning. And that is because white privilege offers both psychological and material benefits. So although there might be in improvements associated with class coalition, in essence, to have that, whites would have to give up the white privilege associated with group membership. Um, this frame fits with sociologist Hubert Brummer's thesis that race prejudice exists basically in a sense of group position rather than a set of feelings which members of one racial group have towards members of another racial group. Basically, group relative position transcends individual feelings about race. Tangible examples of white privilege and the property rights in whiteness include the fact that blacks who live in families where the head graduated from college typically have lower net wealth positions than white households where the head dropped out of high school. Other examples include Diva Pager study that demonstrates that white males that signal prior incarceration have a greater rate of employment callbacks than black males who signal no prior incarceration. And the fact that Black expectant mothers who graduated from college have a greater likelihood of an infant mortality than white expectant mothers who dropped out of high school. And when it comes to liquid assets, financial assets that can be readily converted into cash, black and Latinos are nearly penniless. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but let me just point out that the median liquid assets for a black family is about $200 and compared to $23,000 for a white family. And if we exclude retirement savings, the typical black family has about $25 in the bank. Much of the framing around wealth disparity, including the use of, in terms of liquid assets, much of the framing, in turn, in, including the use of alternative financial service products, focuses on poor financial choices and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino, and poor borrowers which is often tied to a cultural poverty thesis where they are attributed as regarding an undervalue and a low acquisition for education. The framing is wrong. The directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely that meager economic circumstance and not poor decision making or deficient knowledge constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no other option but to attain and use predatory and abusive alternative financial products. Financial behavior and financial literacy are practically useless for households that have little finances to manage in the first place. Furthermore, the regressive and predatory fines and fees imposed by local governments to balance fiscal budgets often extract rather than empower black and Latino households with limited assets. The goal of government should be to empower, not extract. On the debt side of the ledger, some debt is indicative of good financial health. For instance, housing debt, student loan debt, traditionally have provided Americans with access to finance to purchase the economic security of an appreciating asset of a home or a job in a professional or managerial sector. 
However, what we traditionally conceive of as good and bad debt has different implications when we consider race and the prevailing framework of targeting unprivileged racial groups with inferior housing and educational products. Predatory finance, as well as the ongoing housing and labor market discrimination, that limits the choice and rate of return on home ownership and a college degree based on race and ethnicity. Further, the growing context of income and expense volatility, where Americans increasingly have less control of when and how long they work, make access to short-term credit even more essential. It is not surprising that, to a greater extent, Black and Latino families turn to unconventional predatory lending, products like payday lending as a last resort, to deal with any number of financial emergencies and budgetary shortfalls. Let me move on. I'm going to get to the point of the talk. That's a lot of background. Um, but here's the point of the talk. Midway through his 2013 commencement address at Morehouse College, President Barack Obama invoked the black American legacy of triumphant leaders who, without excuses, were able to overcome tremendous structural barriers and achieve great things. He says, quote, you now hail from a lineage and legacy of immeasurable strong men, men who bore tremendous burdens and still laid the stones for the path on which we walk. You wear the mantle of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington and Ralph Bunch, Langston Hughes, George Washington Carver, Ralph Abernathy, Thurgood Marshall, and yes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These men were many things to many people, and they knew full well the role that racism played in their lives. But when it came to their own accomplishments and sense of purpose, they had no time for excuses. The president continues his inspirational speech to the graduating class at an elite historically black college, and he says, every one of you have a grandma or an uncle or a parent who's told you that at some point in life as an African American, you have to work twice as hard as anyone else if you want to get by. And that's not a unique message to black Americans. I'm sure there are women in the audience whose mother had, mothers or parents have told them to overcome their obstacles, they need to be twice as good. Um, but the question becomes, at what cost? Are there economic and health consequences associated with above normal efforts for these highly educated and racially stigmatized black graduates in a context of a racially stigmatized America? To me, that's the question. The emerging consensus in, is that social determinants of health, which the World Health Organization defines as the condition in which individuals are born, grow, live, work, and age, are the primary determinants of health and likewise health dis disparity. Hence, the presumption is that if a greater share of blacks and Latinos invested more in a good education, which in turn would result in a better job and a higher income, then health disparity would dramatically reduce or be eliminated. Education is positively associated with better health for all Americans. However, racial disparity in health persists and even worsens at higher levels of education. For instance, like I mentioned before, black expectant mothers with a college degree, they have higher infant mortality rates than white women who have dropped out of high school, and it is more than double at every level, but the rate of difference increases with higher levels of education. In fact, let me skip that. So this is not consistent with a social determinant model that proxies for individual self-investment and agency with education as the explanation for health disparity. The most educated black expectant mothers have worse health outcomes than the least educated white women. This pattern of disparity is not limited to infant mortality. Racial mortality differences persist across many major disease types, including cancer, heart disease, stroke, and HIV-related causes. And disturbingly, and perhaps more alarmingly, these disparities rise with higher levels of educational attainment. There is a physical and psychological cost of stigma and ironically exerting individual agency, working, hard, working twice as hard to get by 
that I argue is, or at least I conjecture, is it explaining the limited role of education and income as protective factors for blacks relative to whites. The added effort of stigma imposed on high achieving blacks that threaten the relative position of the dominant white group may translate into deleterious health and economic conditions for these high achieving blacks. For instance, public health scholar Sherman James hypothesized that, quote, a strong behavioral predisposition to cope actively with psychosocial environmental stressors, interact with low socioeconomic status to influence the health of African Americans. He, he labeled this theory John Henryism, after the fable of the hammer-wielding black railroad worker who emerged victorious against a tunnel-digging machine in a race to see who could dig through the tunnel faster. It's the classic man over machine fable metaphor. Um, but the cost, anybody familiar with John Henry? He collapses at the end from heart disease. I think that's a horrible fable to tell children. <laughs> he wins the race, but he dies at the end. Um, so Sherman James uses this as a metaphor to describe some of the health disparities. The John Henryism theory explains that low socioeconomic status blacks are chronically exposed to psychosocial stress, threat of job loss, trying to make ends meet, social insults linked to race and class, etc., and thus are required to exert considerable energy on a daily basis to co cope with conditions of high anxiety and uncertainty. The unfortunate irony is that blacks who put forth the highest effort to cope with their difficult circumstances are the ones with the greatest risk of negative health consequences, in other words, high blood pressure. As an example, John Henry may be extended to demonstrate, so I propose to extend, extend Sherman James's theory to see if John Henryism can explain why, as socioeconomic status rises, the relative difference between blacks and whites also rise. So be, to be clear, I'm not saying that blacks who have higher education have worse health outcomes than blacks with lower education, but rather the relative difference is, is higher between blacks and whites. The prevalence of neoliberal and post-racial racial thought, both framed in a politic of personal responsibility, which emphasize individual agency, particularly self-investments in education as a pathway towards upward mobility and efficient social distribution, might literally be bad for black people's health. Essentially, the tragic irony is that the political rhetoric that emphasizes hard work, individual agency, and personal responsibility may enhance harmful social stigma that imposes physical and psychological health costs on a socially stigmatized population. So I can go through and talk about some similar examples with regards to economic outcomes like wealth. We know that the wealth gap rises at higher levels of, of education and that black households with a college degree have less wealth than white households with a head dropped out of high school. But in the interest of time, I'll move on. Um, but I'm not arguing that education is bad. In essence, education is not the antidote, antidote for the enormous racial gaps in both wealth and employment. And again, I'm not trying to diminish the value of education. There's clear intrinsic value to education, along with a public responsibility to expose everyone with a high quality education that teaches them to synthesize and fuse information into big ideas with encouraging teachers trained to deliver curriculum from grade school all the way through college. And, but it is a myth that black families do not value education. But what is problematic is the societal overemphasis on education, on the economic returns to education as the panacea to address socially established structural barriers of eco racial economic inclusion. Okay. How am I doing on time? All right, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I can probably cover a lot of this in Q&A. So I'm going to skip ahead and just basically say the cruel ironies is that the post-racial and politics of personal responsibility and neoliberal paternalistic tropes, which emphasize no excuses, grit, hard work, 
may actually exacerbate economic and health disparity, particularly for those that pose a competitive threat to the preferred position of the socially dominant group. In order to address the dramatic and racial disparities in health, particularly at higher levels of socioeconomic status, we need to put to rest the rhetorical metaphors like John Henry, black man over machine, and instead focus on the business of eliminating social structures where individuals from socially stigmatized groups have to, in the former president's, wor pr former president's words, work twice as hard to get by. Instead, we need a paradigm shift that heeds the words of the Reverend Dr. William Barber, where economic justice is a moral imperative. And to fulfill that vision, we need an economic bill of right rights for all Americans that provides them the economic security, dignity, and agency to be self-determining and attaining their self-defined goals. Examples of policies that are related to the neoliberal paternalistic trope include things like the British poor laws of the 19th century. They include things like income maintenance programs rather than income mobility programs. They include things like social isolation, basically segregation, military conscription policies, mass incarceration, policies aimed at controlling reproduction, fertility, and family formation, and then social experimentation on surplus populations. The most egregious might be the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, but perhaps more benign but still potentially harmful, moving to opportunity experiments where we try to literally move a population to another neighborhood. Instead, a stratification approach towards policies that can address some of our structural inequalities, well, I lead with one that's race-based, reparations. Reparations for slavery, Jim Crow, as well as some exclusion from New Deal and post-war policies. If people critique that as not being politically feasible at this moment, we have some what we call race-conscious policies, and I use the term universal race-conscious as opposed to targeted universalism because there was a period where people advocated for target universalism where if we address income and poverty, that that would have overreaching racial, racial effects because of the, the, over, the over representation of blacks in those, in those areas that would lead to greater racial equality. Well, as I pointed out, that across the socioeconomic status spectrum, we find inequality. So I find more appealing the narrative of race-conscious universal policies. So I'm going to go through them quickly, and then I'm going to stop. One would be baby bonds. The program is analogous to a social security program for young adults that provides capital finance so that they can begin a lifetime of building assets and economic security independent of the financial position and decision-making of the families in which they're born. So every American child would be endowed with an account that can mature when they become an adult and used towards some asset-enhancing activity. And those accounts would be based on the wealth position that you're born into. Um, and then federal job guarantee. A federal job guarantee offers the economic security of a living wage to all citizens. It provides investment in public and physical infrastructure and provides an implicit floor on wages and worker amenities and provides the job of jobs for socially stigmatized populations, including those formerly incarcerated, and it increases the bargaining power for all workers by removing the threat of unemployment. Fourth, I say federalized credit scores, and this is particularly relevant given what's going on in the news. A metric so determinant on an individual's life chances should not be left to the, to the private sector. It should be transparent, and it should have the accountability that goes along with being an elected official. Number five, postal banking. To provide banking services and short and long-term loans, particularly for unprivileged individuals who financially have to rely on predatory check cashing institutions, payday lending, basically it puts a floor on financial products available to all Americans and all, all citizens. Um, six, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission should proactively conduct employment audits to detect racial discrimination and prosecute 
discriminating firms. Seven, federal subsidy to HBCUs to the tune of the present value of the support reached for other colleges and universities from post-World War II GI Bill, for example. It's evident that blacks still need stereotype safe environments to mitigate hostility and provide curriculum more relevant to their experiences. Number eight, we should eliminate tracking altogether in grade school and offer universally, quote, talented and gifted educational programs for all. Number nine, another one that's relevant contemporarily, single payer health insurance, Medicare for all, that's self-explanatory. And number 10, stop mass incarceration, particularly for nonviolent offenders, hold police criminally and civilly responsible for abusive police practice, and then one that typically goes over well on college campuses, legalize marijuana. <laughs> so we will take questions from the audience. I guess this is for both of you. Um, I was impressed with the life expectancy chart showing that black women life expectancy was greater than white men. And I'm sure it's the same in the US, but you might be able to confirm that. I'm interesting, interested in your explanation as to why black women seem to do so much better, I think in both countries, than black men. Well, I, I think it depends on the, well, okay, two things. One, it depends on the counterfactual. Uh, so if you're looking at black men relative to white men in comparison to black women relative to white women, that's not always the case. For example, HIV AIDS, I think that black women have a 51 greater likelihood of mortality from a HIV AIDS related disease than a white woman. That might not be exactly right, but it's, it's close to right. Um, so, um, overall, women have higher life expectancy than men, um, but if we're doing a comparison of within group of, within gender groups, I don't think it's always the case that um, white, black women are doing relatively better in comparison to black men. Uh, thanks for the question. I don't have a lot to add other than I think this may be a time where Derek's notion that the narratives and rhetoric that we have so pervasively embedded might explain some of this as well. So the narratives and rhetoric around black men uh, are, are probably particularly damning in terms of their opportunity, particularly their economic opportunities and um, uh, their 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 status vis-a-vis -vis the police. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably a lot that goes into that, right? So there's behavior, there's treatment. Um, men might engage in behavior that, that is uh, more detrimental than women in, in many instances. But uh, Arjuman also pointed out the issue of different treatment. We often talk about intersectionality, and I think this is a good point to bring this up. Um, Intersectionality will affect different intersections differently depending on context. And usually when we think about intersectionality, we talk about it in terms of both a gender or race and ethnicity, but that gender could be both male and female. And, and again, depending on context, an encounter with a policeman, I suspect that having a male identity in black is worse than if you have a, a black identity in a female and, and a wo gen woman in a female gender, right? But in other contexts, if that won't hold. Hi. When you look at mass incarceration, what are the health outcome disparities between like uh, just a regular urban community and then the health disparity between people who've been incarcerated? Um, yeah. And economic disparity too, because, yeah. Thanks. Um, so I don't know the literature thoroughly, so take what I, I'm, I'm going to say with a grain of salt. Um, 
some of the findings have not indicated that incarcerated black men have worse health. In fact, some of them have in indicated that they have better health than the general population, which is sort of staggering. And some have suggested that the explanation may be that, you know, stunningly, the conditions outside may be even worse than the conditions inside. Yes, less health care out there, more stress, more uncertainty, and so on. So we're not sure, but there are some studies that are suggesting that it's not clear that um, in terms of the outcome. So in, in other words, it's, it's not a causal association between it's great to be incarcerated. You know, it's not a, it's a more damning, um, um, it, it's an indictment of the outside rather than um, what it says about the inside. Argument just mentioned uh, health care, for instance. That, that is a place in America where you get guaranteed health care. Not necessarily might not be adequate health care, but there is health care provided in prison versus no health care if you're out of prison. And this is also a point where Rucker Johnson, for instance, I know he did a study looking at the role of incarceration and in prevalence of HIV incidents, not just for black men, but black women. So there's an intersectional analysis to that as well of all this higher this high incarceration rate of black men and its impact on black women through i guess uh certain types of disease ailments that might take place I have a question. Um, <clears throat> can Does either of your scholarships speak to the health and economic outcomes for recent black immigrants or second or third generation Caribbean, West African, African uh, immigrants in terms of any differences between their potential health and income prospects versus those who are descendants of American slaves? I'll go quickly. I think you probably have more to say. Um, thanks. I, I think part of the Canadian story may also involve the fact that most blacks in Canada are only one, two, three max generations out from having immigrated. The analyses we did controlled for immigrant status, but very crudely. It basically controlled for whether you yourself had immigrated or not. But in the Canadian context, when you compare immigrants and non-immigrants, even non-immigrants are only a couple generations out max, whereas in the US context, if you compare immigrant and non-immigrant blacks, non-immigrants are a very different group. They're usually going to be slave descendants. So um, what we know is that in general, there is some sort of a protective um, health effect of being an immigrant across the board by race. Um, and we think that's because of a few things. One is just the selection process. So people who immigrate tend to have either resources, be healthier, have the kinds of characteristics that allow them to immigrate. Um, we think partly it may have to do with your identity and socialization into a new world in which um, your race is being formed. So in Canada, we, we use this sort of odd term. I find it really odd. Um, so we don't call, we don't talk about race. We talk about being racialized. And it's, I think, a nod to this sensibility that, for example, if you come from Africa, your blackness may not be as much salient in your, uh, uh, your, sending country, we call them often, the country that you came from, as blackness is when you come to Canada. So you become racialized as black. And so there is lots of evidence in the U.S. context about health and economic outcomes that are far worse as you move away from being a first-gen immigrant and and the longer you spend in in um, your, your, ho your new country, your host, your host country. Um, hi. So uh, my question has to do with uh, sort of the gentrification of disaster, right? So you talked a little bit, Derek, about recovery, um, families' ability to recovery after an emergency. Um, what, if any, are there connections between the family's economic ability to recover and um, health disparities that one may see after a large-scale um, 
disaster re like Katrina. Now that we're talking about like Harvey and Irma um, here in the United States, obviously we don't have those data for places like the Caribbean or, or South America where those things happen very often, but we're seeing them more often here. So what are some, if there are any connections between a family's ability to recover um, after economically after a disaster and a family's health impact after a large scale disaster? So I don't know the specific evidence, but I can speak in generalities, and I know people that have studied it more intensely. Um, but for example, Hurricane Katrina and other disasters as well in places like Bangladesh, um, natural disasters aren't natural. <laughs> um, we know that certain groups are more protected against a natural disaster than others. Um, and uh, there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that the effects are disproportionately felt, but I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, I don't know the exact literature to be able to answer the question. The only thing I would add to that is that um, there's some interesting evidence from literatures that you could collectively consider as being about what happens when there's an economic disaster. And so the recession is one, but let me give you another example that's interesting. If you look at what happened to health uh, in Russia uh, after the collapse of communism, where there was this sudden change from communist institutions to capitalist institutions, we saw a massive increase in mortality, particularly amongst Russian men. And it was overnight, it was on the scale of an increase in mortality and a decrease in life expectancy that you would have if you had like a sudden epidemic of an infectious disease. Um, and we think it's precisely because it was very difficult to cope um, with disaster circumstances, especially when, um, it's, you know, whether it's a natural disaster or an economic one, the scale of the disaster is so large, it sort of overwhelms people's abilities to function because the daily institutions of life, forget your sort of individual circumstances, your, the, the sort of institutional circumstances of society change so quickly um, that it's, it's very difficult to recover. I think, obviously, I think, you know, Derek would say, uh, and it, I think it's true, the people who recover or benefit are the ones that have wealth. It's not even just that they have income. Income's not enough. In the Russian case, jobs just disappeared overnight. Um, and so wealth is certainly a major buffer in any kind of disaster situation. Yeah, I just even a little more clarity about... Uh, the Deaton and Case study, it's not as if the white mortality rose higher than the black mortality for that same demographic. The point was the rate of change. It was one where the black rate had plateaued for the most part and the white rate still rose, but it was still the case that blacks had higher mortality. Something else that you all may have seen, the Washington Post just had an article out that um, over since 1999, the demographic group that experienced a real loss in, in wage and in income, uh, family income, was black Americans. No other group, not like we had great prosperity over that period, but black Americans actually had a decline in their income over that period. So um, the arguments around resiliency, I think, are pertinent and important to understand, but think about rates of change in addition to levels if we're looking at group comparisons. No more questions? Oh, here we go. Oh, how are we doing? Hi, I'm Amber Tom. Um, about um, the economic bill of rights you mentioned and the list of things that you gave uh, towards the end of your talk. Um, what does that look like in baby steps? Because I know that's something that, that we want to get to, but jumping to that may be um, fast for America. Um, <laughs> but what I've, I've uh, paid attention to lately, um, Charlottesville, Charlottesville um, Vice Mayor, what's his name, Wes Bellamy, passed something called an equity package. 
And the equity package was essentially he found money that was left over in the city's budget to address certain things specifically for the black community. And um, they did stuff like renovate some of the housing, um, um, direct a black male achievement coordinator. They did some stuff with making sure that everybody had um, access to, I think, um, training for vocational stuff and something about uh, high school diplomas and things like that. It, is that what you're, can that be a baby step towards getting us to the place where we can do some things around the um, economic bill of rights? And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at ways to, to systematically do that across smaller communities where that will really make a difference on a local level. I mean, that, uh, that's a great question, great point. You know, I'll say a couple of things. One is the Economic Bill of Rights, in part, is presented because we present some dramatic and drastic inequality. And sometimes, if you present this inequality, people throw their hands up and say, this is somehow natural. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, there's a recent paper out that describes, and they're good friends and colleagues, and I, I think they're, you know, I support their work, but they talk about how they project that the black wealth will become zero in year blah, blah, blah. I don't like those narratives. The reason why I don't like those narratives is because the wealth gap itself was created, so there's policy that we can do. There's policy that created it, and likewise, there's policy we can do to adjust it. So I like coupling the dramatic inequality with some things that we can actually do to address it because it's not natural, and it's a, it, I believe it's a choice. And I believe that there are choices we can make to come up with a different outcome. That said, um, uh, things that happen at the local level organically, I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, so I applaud people that, that are willing to try to address conditions, particularly on a local level with the agency that they have. And you know, some people may say, well, given this current moment that we're in, in the, with the federal government, um, that you're not going to get those policies. Why are you even putting them up there? Um, there are things we can do at the local level. So maybe um, we can think about a localized job guarantee program, a localized baby bonds program, a localized, you know, some municipalities are now already thinking about um, tuition-free college education. That should have been on my list anyway. Um, but, you know, so there are things we can do at the local level that's important anyway. And um, the address the question of, what can we can do about this? Well, I want to make sure that we have at least some policies that I've thought through. Other people have thought through other policies that we can put forth to address the issues. I just want to add one thing, um, which is a little bit of a caution about the idea that baby steps might eventually get us somewhere. Um, in health, what we've learned is that often uh, what uh, people do is they identify uh, that there is a health inequality happening. And public health departments and governments start to figure out what can we do to address the, the health inequality. And often what happens is they put in programs and services um, that help people do something. Maybe they um, have cooking classes so that you can address your eating habits and therefore reduce diabetes and so on. Sometimes they do blood pressure measurements as a sort of signal that something's wrong and you need to address it. They go to barbershops, et cetera. There's all sorts of programs that happen. Um, and in Toronto, uh, one of many experiences where this happened, where they noted health inequalities in uh, when they measured them, in, the Toronto Public Health Department measured them in the mid 2000s, implemented many of these baby steps because they can't couldn't figure out, you know, how would they uh, make massive policy change to change resource inequalities. They implemented these baby steps, and in 2015, when they went to remeasure health inequalities after a 10-year concerted effort to reduce them, health inequalities had risen. And they had risen because those baby steps simply cannot make up for the massive issues people face. So if you have a breastfeeding program for low-income women, that does not supplant a precarious labor market and low wages 
and umpteen you know, high uh, housing uh, uh, costs. It's very difficult for those baby steps to address the degree of inequality and the fundamental causes, as we call them in public health. Very difficult unless you address those. And in fact, what's interesting about the opioid epidemic, I mean, that PBS clip makes it sound like we're all in agreement that it's the economy. If you look at national public health strategies and medical system strategies around opioid use, they are all directed at uh, prescribing policies, at the medical system and how the medical system is dealing with opioid use. None of them mention that we, sh we should think about the economic precursors. And what we've learned in public health is even if you figure out how to address the opioid epidemic by baby steps to change prescribing patterns and so on and so forth, some other epidemic will c crop up as a result of not fixing the economy. So the economic stuff is so fundamentally tied to every outcome that without addressing it, somehow, some way, it will assert itself. Spot on. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Um, thank you for that. So I know we're, we're winding down. I, I, I want to just mention that a lot of the ideas I presented today are not solely mine. I'm up here speaking them, but I just want to give shout outs to William Darity at Duke, uh, Kai Za, Mark Paul, and then a couple of new school alums that have worked to help develop this, Alan Aha and Daniel Bustillo. They're not here. Um, and uh, did you want to say anything else? Or? I had a slide with all okay. my shout outs, but hi, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're giving shout outs. My sister's in the audience. <laughs> no, joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the questions were provocative. Thank you so much for that interchange. And I'm not just saying it cliche. They really were. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Arjuman for coming. Um, again, it, it is a pleasure to have her sit here and inform me a great deal. But outside of this lecture, she is the person I rely to most whenever I have anything to say about health. I go and, and speak to her as if I'm a colleague, but I'm really a student at her at her foot yeah, at no. trying to learn from her. So uh, yeah. thank you for coming down. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys.